All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews every Monday and every Friday right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. Helps out the channel, lets you know when all these cool interviews are coming up. And if you think you can ask better questions of my guests, maybe you can, then go to the Patreon link in the description, pick the appropriate tier. You'll be asking the questions. You can also watch some of these interviews a week or two before anybody else. We have got a great guest today. He's promoting a new project called Atomic Kings. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about his uh, history with the bad Badlands. I know a favorite of people in the hard rock uh, world with that also featured uh, Jakey Lee. So we're going to talk about that. And we got a whole bunch of other things to get to also right after that. Just I noticed in that introduction, I failed to say his name, Greg Chason. Oh yeah, I had to. Rem I was think. I was thinking, are you going to actually be talking to me? <laughs> you were like, that guy's got an impressive list of credits. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing what he has to say. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, Greg. I was. I was like, I'm going to Google as many people saying your name as possible, so I don't screw it up. Well, it's only been pronounced every possible way. Uh, I always like to tell the story of my daughter played high school uh, softball and they would always announce her when, when she was coming to hit and for three years they, no one even came close to pronouncing it correctly and then she was playing at a game a game at a, at, at a small school an away game and the announcer announced her name and said it correctly and I went up to him and I said hey just want to say thank you you're the first announcer in three seasons that said it right I said how do you know how to say it and he said I'm from Louisiana and in Louisiana chase on is as common as Smith Smith yeah so he he was familiar with the name that's funny yeah I was gonna say either that he knew the he was from the south or he was a Badlands fan <laughs> Well, maybe, but I've heard my name pronounced Chasson, Kaysen, Kasson, Chaseon, Chaseon. I mean, Jeff Martin, you know, who played in Badlands with me, to this day, he can't pronounce it. I've only known him since high school. Yeah, I don't feel as bad then uh, for putting the work into it. <laughs> so we're going to talk about your career, as I said, but we want to talk about Atomic Kings. This was formerly known as Kings of Dust. You're based out of Phoenix, Arizona. So tell me a little bit about what's going on right now. Well, let me show you what's going on right now, Riley. My daughter's going to bring in what's what's happening at my house right now. All right, I'm excited. Here it is. All right, this is oh, <laughs> this is Cheney, and he is named after a character uh, in a Charles Bronson movie called Hard Times, mm -hmm. and he is a ten week or ten and a half week old dog to Bordeaux puppy. And uh, he'll at some point weigh 150 pounds. And uh, this was my birthday present to myself. And uh, so he's uh, taking up most of our time as we're house training and, and lease training him. Yeah, but we love him and he's great. So I just thought I'd share Cheney to making him more famous than he already is on my Facebook page. Uh, so Cheney the dog to Bordeaux. What a great uh, addition to the family. I think so. Thank you. Here, I'm going to give him back to my daughter here. Mm -hmm. He's already a big dog. He weighs about 30 pounds. So um, we have a full-grown bulldog that weighs 45 pounds, and Cheney's already <laughs> at 10 weeks almost the same weight as uh, our bulldog, Hemi. That's wild. Yeah, well, they grow up fast. They do. And at 150 pounds, he'll be taking up quite a bit of space. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's going to need his own room soon, too. Yeah, pretty much. He'll need a room of his own. He'll probably just get this one. Yeah. With, as the kids get out of the house, you bring in the dogs. Exactly. Exactly. So tell me a little bit about Atomic Kings. Atomic Kings is uh, an original uh, hard rock band uh, in the style of the 70s. Um, uh, not unlike the great bands from the 70s, whether it be Deep Purple or Free or Bad Company or Grand Funk or Zeppelin or Sabbath. I have a lot of those same influences. Uh, it features Ken Ronk on lead vocals, uh, Ryan McKay 
on lead guitar and vocals and uh, Jimmy Taft on drums and yours truly on bass. And uh, we don't write with an, uh, an eye or an ear on whether it's commercial or not. We just kind of write what we write. And we are getting ready to go in and record sometime this fall. Um, we've got 13 songs or we've actually got 15 songs written and uh, we'll record um, probably 10 of them. Our songs are uh, everything you liked about the 70s, riff rock, bluesy. It's got some funk to it. It's got some fusion-y sort of things. It's got a little prog element to it. Um, it's got a little country, southern rock sort of thing to it. And our songs are anywhere from, on this record coming up, say four minutes to five and a half minutes long. So uh, lots of guitar solos, lots of... Uh, uh, all the stuff that I liked about music in the 70s is what I do in Atomic Kings, not on like Badlands. That's one of the things I liked about Badlands so much. And I know we'll talk about that later is the fact that we got to draw from all of our influences and we didn't really care whether it was going to be on the radio or not. We just wrote what we wrote and we liked it. And Atomic Kings is the same way. We write what we write. We like what we write. Oddly enough, it's hooky as well. Mm -hmm. even probably because there's so many parts in it but yeah we're pretty happy with it yeah and so we're going to put a link in the description to the social media and things is there a little bit of music that people can check out we're actually getting ready to go in the studio here in about three weeks to uh, actually record a song so we can put it on our website there's some teasers of just us in rehearsal if you go on the atomic kings facebook page there's some of that and uh like I said, if you liked the 70s or if you liked my previous project, Kings of Dust, you'll love this. So it's a really nice progression from where I was at a year ago. Yeah. Okay. Well, hopefully, so people will go to the description and then they can start following it and yep. see the progress as the band uh, grows. And because it's such a different time now, you know, you can get music to people so fast. So uh, that's, that's one of the good things about technology. Yes. There's a few. One of the few, I was going to say, there's not a whole lot of things I like about technology, but I do enjoy the fact that, you know, it's pretty uh, instantly gratif gratifying. Yeah. And, the, and, and, you know, when you were promoting a record before, you'd have to go to radio stations and hope to get, a, you know, spots and call -ins. Now you can sit in your, your living room or your son's former bedroom right. and you can just break out a whole press junket. Well, the funny thing is we had a bunch of shows. I guess it's not funny, actually. We had some shows for uh, Atomic Kings, and um, so far a bunch of them have been canceled because of the new wave of COVID concerns. Right. And so um, in theory, we have a show that we're going to play in Safford, Arizona, um, I think on the 25th. I could be wrong of September, but I think that's right. And then we have a show in November in no fact and it's a big festival at big surf which uh if you're not familiar with arizona it's like a surf park and they have a huge wave machine and you can surf in there and uh there's going to be us and i think 13 other bands including uh, uh the headlining band will be of gods and monsters um really great heavy hard rock band ira black kevin gucher norn england and uh simon wright uh, yeah. from ACDC, great band. And then the other, the next band would be, uh, the first support band would be Bitch, a famous band from the LA 80s. Um, probably not as well known as uh, as it would be in LA, but still an interesting act. I saw them a lot of times when I lived in LA. Yeah. And then we are second support uh, as Atomic Kings. And then there'll be another, probably 11 other bands. So I believe that is November 3rd. Um, but that is on our website. If you have a chance, check that out on our Facebook page and uh, where those two shows are. And if you're anywhere in the neighborhood, come and check it out. Yeah, absolutely. And you're Arizona based. You started in Arizona, your career built in Arizona, and you're, you're still there now. Um, so th that you've been part of the, the scene and seen it change so many times. I want to talk to you a little bit about early on Surgical Steel. Uh, I was watching some of it, and right before we went on, I, I said, let me do some research on Surgical Steel. And then, I, of course, I had to ask you, were you in this movie, and what was your answer? 
thankfully I was not involved. They had kicked me out of the band by then and I was never so happy to not make $5,000 um, as opposed to being in that movie. I mean, those guys are all friends of mine and, and I'm glad they got to do it. But when I saw the movie, I was like, oh man, I really dodged a bullet. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you didn't have to co-star with Leif Garrett. I just thought, you know, it, it was a pretty laughable movie, I guess. I mean, if you look at it as kind of like a comedy sort of thing, uh, to me, it's more interesting that way than it is as like a serious movie. I mean, it's a cool movie. Clancy Brown's in it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, there can only be one uh, from uh, The Highlander um, starring Clancy Brown as the villain. But um, it's just an oddball movie. And and uh, and uh, by then I was in L.A. and I was probably in Steeler at that point. Um, but, uh, yeah, they did it. They made some money. And when it came out, I know they were all pretty disappointed. <laughs> I think the I think the expectations don't always live up to what it's supposed to be. Surgical Steel, though, if you look at it, highly Judas Priest influenced. In the movie, you'd almost you would think you're looking at a Priest cover band. And what's so interesting about this is Rob Halford's involvement with Surgical Steel. So tell me a little bit about how that happened. Uh, the guitar player Jim Keeler and I. Uh, in the, the slightly longer version is. Jim Keeler and I started the band. It didn't work out. And he joined another band and asked if he could have the name Surgical Steel. And um, I said, yeah, sure, whatever. And then uh, they were kind of a cover band. And then uh, they had done a show opening for uh, Uriah Heep and they got booed off the stage and because they played covers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Jim Keeler and... Uh, the other guys in the band said, hey, would you join the band again? Because at the time I could write. And they were really kind of fle just fleshing out the writing part of it. And so I joined again and uh, we started writing our own songs. And oddly enough, we played with Uriah Heap again. And from that point on, we kind of went, everything was going good. We went on, we kind of went down gangbusters because we had our own material as opposed to trying to be something else. When we originally were writing it was kind of a cross between real early priest like say uh you know british steel uh sad wings of destiny that sort of period and and iron maiden like the first couple maiden records so it was kind of that style um the way that we met rob is jim keeler met him at a rock bar in town here called mr lucky's and he called me and he said hey uh are you gonna have the jerry cooney uh larry holmes fight on pay-per-view and i said yeah and he goes can i bring rob halford over and i said yeah sure why don't you bring uh david lee roth and uh, jimmy page with you not mm -hmm. believing him and um sure enough he brought over rob halford over to my house and in phoenix at the time the only real major rock star was alice cooper and he didn't you know wasn't living here at that point or uh, if he was i wasn't aware of it so to have Rob Halford in your living room was uh, pretty unexpected. And it was a pretty big deal. So um, we got to talking with him and he wanted to see the band. He knew we had a heavy metal band. We were kind of really influenced by the new wave of British heavy metal. And so we arranged a gig and he came and saw us and he really liked it. Came on stage and sang with us one of many times that he did it. And... Um, kind of really was supportive of the band and uh, tried to help the band get a record deal along the way. I got kicked out of the band and uh, moved to LA and Rob was still involved with them. And, you know, they came close to getting a record deal a couple of times, but it just never really happened along the way. They kind of changed from being like kind of this iron maiden early priest thing to kind of whatever priest was doing at the time. They were very influenced by that. They were influenced by, priest's whole attitude on stage and everything else and that would have never really worked for me I, I mean there already was a judas priest why would you try to do a second one and i think that if they had stayed on the original course which was you know more like a mixture of like maiden and saxon and tigers of pantang and zeppelin and sabbath and early priest they'd have stayed on that 
path, I think they might have got a record deal. I mean, they had the musicians to do it. I mean, Jeff Martin's a great singer. The drummer, Bob Milan, was one of my favorite drummers. Um, there was just a great band, Paul Kasanovich, Jim Keeler, great friends of mine. And, and uh, they had a shot. It just didn't work out. It's just yeah, and it appeared on uh, Surgical Steel was on the Metal Massacre too. And they were. So, and I was. I was actually on that. Yeah, and so it would. There was a buzz, and one of the things that was happening in Arizona is Rob Halford would cut would come out to see you guys, and eventually said that he would come on stage and jam. And it's funny. It's almost like the Brady Bunch episode where she says she's going to get Davy Jones to come to the prom, and everyone says, "Oh yeah, right." You guys are saying, "No, we're going to have Rob Halford on stage tonight," and you were basically playing these sort of illegal backyard parties you put a stage in you, you could go out into the desert and yep. and sure enough rob halford does show up well two interesting facts to that is the first time we played with rob um we told a bunch of people that he was going to be there and come on stage and play with us and no one believed so we we normally drew about a thousand people every time we played to these outdoor it was a place in town called pc warehouse and this guy had this huge outdoor loading dock and we would set up a stage on there and play and you get about a thousand people that would show up had beer it was it, completely illegal mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when we announced that rob was going to be there about three thousand people showed up and i think two thousand of them showed up to make sure that it wasn't rob halford and to laugh at us when rob halford didn't show up and sure enough rob came on stage it was jeff martin's first gig as our singer so he was kind of nervous. Rob was kind of his idol. And we came out and played this show and we brought Rob up on stage and everyone went crazy. The best part is there was still, you know, a hundred people there that were saying, oh, that wasn't really Rob Halford. That was a, that was a Rob Halford imitator. And uh, so that kind of cemented our legend, if you will, in Phoenix, as far as that concerned, the fact that Rob and Rob played with other bands in town after that as well, but he would always, come and you know play with us the um what was my second point there there was another point to my story and i already forgot it about regarding rob um and well, uh, if it comes to me again i'll yeah well it was <laughs> i had a senior moment yeah it, well he did he did come on stage several times you know like you said he might have jammed with some other bands too but i think a lot of people surgical steel is building a local following and people are starting to know hey he could show up I'll give you an interesting factoid. He gave us the thing I wanted to tell you is he had sent us a cassette, advanced cassette copy of uh, um, those, the one with Electric Eye on it. Uh, which which album is that? Uh, oh, I can't remember. He had sent us a, a, a copy of, of Screaming for Vengeance. And he was coming back into town and we had a, we had arranged a show. We had rented out a big bingo hall and we built the stage in there and he was going to come and play with us. He didn't realize that we learned screaming for vengeance, electric eye, and you got another thing coming. So he shows up and we play those songs um, without him singing. He, he gets to hear us playing those before anyone else had ever actually heard them. And he got the surgical steel actually played those three songs live before Judas Priest did. How funny. And he got a big kick out of it because he called Glenn Tipton and told him, Hey, I just heard these guys play. You got another thing coming. And they did the whole breakdown part and everything with, we did the call and response part and everything with the audience. And he was like, that's what we were going to do. He goes, it's nice to know that it works. <laughs> It's actually oh, pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, how, how cool. Uh, and, and for him, how cool to see his, these songs that are now going to become legendary, you know, the first exactly. time they're um, So what, what did you get kicked out of Surgical Steel for? Um, at the time, at, because of uh, uh, the Metal Massacre uh, record, we had done the song on there called Rivet, Rivet Head. Um, we got a lot of response from that. So we got an offer to go to LA and uh, play on the same bill as uh, Hughes and Thrall at the country club. And uh, uh, Alan Niven, who eventually managed Great White, was interested in possibly managing us. I mean, he eventually managed uh, Guns N' Roses. Yeah. At the time he was managing Great White, 
and he had something to do with docking. So he wanted to bring us to LA to play at the uh, country club with uh, Hughes and Thrall. And he also wanted us to go in the studio in LA and he would, he wanted to have Don Dockin produce our demo. So uh, when I talked to the other guys about it, they didn't want to do it. They, they really wanted to kind of um, be the big fish in a small pond thing, so to speak. They were, they didn't want to go to LA. They didn't want to play in LA. They didn't want to compete with that. And I had actually been to LA and seen some of the bands there and they were like way more pro than we were because, you know, they were on the cutting edge of what was going on. And so I was very adamant that we needed to go to LA. If we were going to be successful at this, we couldn't just stay in Phoenix and play the same places. And it came to loggerheads where they just didn't want to go. And I was saying, we need to go. And they said, well, then we're going to let you go. And they kicked me out. And so I, Within a couple months of that, I moved to L.A. and started my career over again in L.A., which actually they did me a huge favor. You know, had I stayed, if I'd, had, if I'd stayed in Phoenix, maybe we would have got a record deal. I don't know. But at that point, they were so enamored with the priest, uh, pro, how priest was progressing musically that they wanted to kind of keep following that kind of whole thing. And in the end, they almost came became kind of like a version of like uh Priest meets poison. They became so commercial and so they had kind of dumbed it down that far. And I really didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they were my friends and it, it bothered me. They, they kicked me out. But I just immediately within two months, I was living in L.A. And I was starting to get in bands in L.A. and kind of, you know, L.A. In, in the early 80s, it was all happening there. Everyone was getting signed. I mean, it's one of those things where you're uh, at a point where you're at the epicenter of what's going on. And I was there during all that, you know, while Motley Crue was getting signed and Rat and Dawkins and Great White and yada, 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 a bunch of bands that I'm not naming here that I can't remember, but everyone was getting some kind of record deal. And I eventually got in Steeler and I thought for sure, and as did Ron, that we would get a record deal. We ended up not getting one. And, but it was a great band to be part of. We headlined, all over California. And uh, we were one of the most popular bands in LA. We were the most popular on band, that's for sure. Who was and, playing guitar? Was it Mitch Perry at that point? No, it was a guy named Kurt James. Um, Mitch, there was three versions or four versions of Steeler. There was the version that Ron brought from Nashville. Then there was a version with Ingve and Rick Fox and Mark Edwards. Then there was another version I believe with Mark Edwards and then Mitch Perry and I forget the bass player's name. I'm sorry. He's a really nice guy and a good bass player. I just can't remember his name at the moment. And then the fourth version was uh, me and Bobby Marks on drums, Kurt James on guitar, and, and of course Ron. And I was in that band about 14 months and we had label interest, you know, regularly labels came to our shows and our shows were always sold out. We played with all the best bands. Um, sometimes bands that had record deals would open for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was th that big of a deal. And uh, I would have been more than happy of, of that had it got a record deal. It just didn't. It turned into Keel. And my brother Kenny got in the band and played bass in that band. And then he got a record deal actually before I did. But I was fine with that. Yeah, your brother Kenny uh, is a bass player as well. And he's a, he played with a bunch of bands. I think he played with Tough uh, as well. brother Todd. So Todd, got, see, there's two brothers. My brother Kenny played in Keel, and that's mainly what he was known for. And he played in some other bands in LA as well after Keel. And then my other brother Todd played in Tough and still is affiliated with them and had his own band called Substance D for a while. But uh, now he, he, him and it, he has a business partner. They own some food trucks mm -hmm. in, in Cleveland. And I think it's called, uh, smoke and rock and roll barbecue i think that's what it's called and he's real successful at that and i think he still does shows with tough from time to time so three of us played bass yeah what what now what a mistake didn't you guys ever watch the partridge family uh you you all had to play something different so you could be no. the band i know but it, the true competitive chase on nature is anything one of us can do the other one can do better so uh it was just kind of like this friendly you know i always say that most people 
get to be the best bass player in their own family. At my house, it was like a slugfest. <laughs> All right, it sure sounds like it. You, you've got like a big bottom uh, bass jam uh, around there. There you go. Yeah. Does anyone else in your family, because now you're a parent, does anyone else play music? Uh, my daughter plays a little acoustic guitar and she plays piano, but it's just kind of like a hobby. She doesn't even really do it that much. My son has an acoustic guitar. I, I run a guitar store, mm -hmm. so I got him a, a acoustic guitar. And I think he's kind of fiddling around with it a little bit. But um, my kids are both jocks. So my son played four years of college baseball. My daughter played three years of, or four years of high school softball. And also she played badminton. And, yeah. uh, and so they like music. And they like the kind of music I like along with whatever it is they like on their own. But they still have a certain soft spot for the kind of music that I grew up with and also what I did in some of the bands I've been in. But uh, I don't think they're ever gonna try to be professional musicians, thank thankfully. Yeah, you maybe after seeing what you've been through, the, uh, sports sounds like a more sound uh, sound uh, thing to do. And, and speaking of things you've been through, I had George Lynch on the show maybe a week or two ago, and he said he wanted to put together uh, an Ozzy Osbourne survivor group. And he was, he's being funny, obviously. But we were talking about so many stories of people involved with Ozzy Osbourne. This morning, I interviewed Carmine Apice, who also has uh, uh, issues with the Ozzy Osbourne camp. It's usually with Sharon Osbourne, not with Ozzy. It seems that Ozzy loves these musicians and he bonds with them, but Sharon has her own ideas and most of them uh, um, seem ridiculous. So <laughs> I I'm gonna give the short Cliff Notes version of the guests that I've had, and then we'll get to your experience because yours is right, right up there. Uh, so George I Lynch- I, was, I think I could be in that band. Yes, I think so. So George Lynch was traveling with him on his own dime and he was gonna replace Brad Gillis and uh, Brad Gillis was gonna go to Night Ranger and George was working his best, but he wasn't famous. He was a working guy, he had kids and they kept him around. He would play at Soundcheck. And eventually he showed up to a, a, one of the sound checks and Jake E. Lee <laughs> walks in the room and Sharon tells him, you're out, we're going with Jake. And Sharon did not like George's haircut. Yeah. She did not like the color of his base. It was green and she said it looks like a booger. And she also didn't like his effects. She didn't, she didn't like how he played. Why Sharon Osborne would be qualified to know about these things? Anyone's guess. So in the same time, George had just got Don Costa in the band you know this story because you've performed with Jake for and been friends for a number of years. Don Costa uh, is supposedly getting in front of Ozzy on stage. They tell him to not do it as much. I guess he tells one of the crew guys that he's still doing it when Ozzy's not looking. He goes on the back of the tour bus. You know the story. Don Costa gets headbutted by Ozzy Osbourne. He gets his nose broken. They pay. He goes to the US Festival. When he gets to the US Festival, Bob Daisley is there and he's informed that he's fired. So th does this sound ridiculous? Yes. My question was, well, I always thought if I was Don Costa, I would have beat the shit out of Ozzy Osbourne. And if that was you, I think you would have as well. Well, that's the upside of me not being an Ozzy. There was a, t a point when, when I was auditioning for him and I went to Scotland on audition for three weeks um, when for the ultimate sin. And I was one of seven bass players and I was actually the last guy that go over there and uh ozzy was still drinking at the time and uh, i knew when ozzy when i was introduced to ozzy the first time i knew i wasn't getting the gig because um when he shook my hand he barely shook my hand and he looked at his uh at a guy that was kind of his valet this guy named bobby thompson rested uh rest in peace a uh, really nice guy and he said to bobby thompson get him out of here. He looks like Charles Bronson in the mechanic. And, uh, I was like, Hey dude, I'm standing right here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they wanted to send me home right then. And, uh, there's this famous story that I was in, I showed up for an audition in sweatpants and all this crap. That's complete nonsense. I, I was at in Inverness, Scotland at this Scottish manor where they had a studio there and everyone had been waiting for Ozzy to get there. I'd already been there for almost five days. And uh, 
when Ozzy showed up, I was like everyone else. I had my T-shirt and my jeans on and, you know, I had my big hair and all this crap. And Ozzy looked at me and just didn't like the way I looked. And he's probably right. I didn't probably have the right look for the uh, whole 80s MTV thing. But he wanted to send me home without even playing. And Jake said, well, hold on. We just spent a whole, you just spent a whole bunch of money flying him out here. He's really good. You know, he's, he's the best bass player that's been out here. Why don't we at least, you know, have a jam with him? And Ozzy said, fine, he can play one song, but then he's going home. And so we went in and rehearsed and um, I ended up managing to hang out for another over two weeks playing with them and rehearsing while they were writing uh, the Ultimate Sin record. So they recorded everything that uh, in every rehearsal. So um, on a lot of those songs, I was writing bass parts for it because at the time I still wasn't sure if I was going to get the gig or not. And then uh, they sent me home and they said they'd call me and let me know <coughs> if I was going to get the gig or not. But I already knew I wasn't going to get it. And uh, Jake then just told me that, uh, yeah, they they didn't think you had the right look for M MTV. And uh, they weren't sure who they were going to get at that time. And then they ended up getting uh, Phil Susan, who had the right look. And he also had a, he also had a shot in the dark with him. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he ended up having the single, which I don't think he's ever been paid for. I was going to say, it, it's a double-edged sword. He writes a hit single for Ozzy Osbourne, but he's been was in suing and in trouble for a long time over that song. Well, I'll tell you, when I was over there, um, like I said, Ozzy was drinking at the time, and we were getting ready to rehearse. And so Ozzy's drunk. It's at night, and he's bitching at me about my bass tone. And I've got an SVT, you know, an Ampeg SVT there, which is, you know, industry standard amp. I, and I've had a million of them. I know what they're supposed to sound like. And Jake told me when, when I was first met him, he said, yeah, two things. Ozzy loves to pick on the bass players, regardless of who's in the band. And number two, um, don't let him get up close to you if he's mad at you, because he'll give you what is called a Birmingham hello, which is a headbutt. It's called, a, it's a nutter. And he'll give you, he'll break your nose, which he did to Don Costa. You were mentioning that. And I believe if I'm not mistaken he also did the same thing to rudy sarzo yeah. and so his thing was when he would get up close he would just give you a bop in the head i would have friggin killed him yeah and then if he did that to me he would have to have killed me because i would a broken nose is nothing to me i've had seven of them the wind blows hard enough my nose breaks mm -hmm. I'd, have, I'd have messed him up yeah the part of the story is where he's bitching at me about my bass sound and uh He's going, oh, your bass sounds like shit. It sounds like a frog farting. And you can make a better bass sound. And I've got my back to him facing the amp. And I'm trying to adjust whatever he's want, whatever he wants. And Randy Castillo's sitting right there looking at Ozzy. And Jake's over on the other side, turning and fa facing his marshal. And I, Jake can see, and we don't really know each other that well at the point, at that point. Jake can see I'm getting mad. And my face is turning red. And I'm kind of glancing over to Jake and Jake's looking at me and he's going like this. Don't do it. He's mouth, he's mouthing. Don't do it. Cause he knows I'm thinking about dropping the bass, right? And I actually was thinking about, okay, I'm going to put the bass down. I'm going to knock Ozzy out, but now I'm stuck in Inverness. I have a plane flight from, I have a ticket from London back to uh, California, but I don't have a plane flight. I don't have a plane ticket from Inverness back to London. So I'm thinking, if I knock Ozzy out right here, how am I going to get from Inverness back to Heathrow? And I don't have any money. They weren't paying me at the time. Mm -hmm. But I, that it came really close where I was thinking, screw this guy. I'm, yeah. I'm not putting up with this BS from him. I was definitely going to have a, have a go at him. And Jake, Jake was so funny because he's just, no, no, don't do it. Don't, no, no, no. <laughs> But uh, it was an experience. I, I didn't get the gig. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, I'm glad that I got to do it. Not very many people get to audition for Ozzy. Uh, not very many people get to go to Scotland to audition for Ozzy. And m the caveat was uh, if I wasn't going to go to the audition. And I convinced Sharon Osbourne if I went to the audition, someone would have to take me to Loch Ness, which is right by Inverness, 
so I could see the Loch Ness, see where the Loch Ness monster hangs out. So they agreed to take me and they took me, they took me out there and I got to walk around Urquhart Castle and where a lot of the Loch Ness sightings have been. And, and it was a pretty good time. And I didn't get the gig. They took me back to uh, the airport in uh, Inverness and they gave me like $2,500. I couldn't believe it. They like you did better than George Lynch. I'll tell you that. Give me 2,500 bucks in cash. I wasn't expecting any, anything. So I was like, Oh, so even if I don't get the gig and at the time they weren't saying I wasn't getting it, they were still saying, well, we're, we're still kind of looking, you're the best bass player we've seen. Um, blah, blah, blah. Now the upside of that is Jake and I ended up becoming good friends and, uh, he actually is the one that told me I wasn't getting the gig. But when Jake would come back to L.A., we would get together and have dinner or hang out and just shoot the breeze. He would call me from the road in the middle of the night just to talk. And I ended up, you know, Jake and I have been friends for, God, over 30 years. Yeah. And that all happened because I auditioned for Ozzy. And so it was a great experience. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's not something everyone gets to talk about. And I'm glad I didn't kick Ozzy's ass. It probably wouldn't have been, you know. Yeah, in the long run, it probably worked out for the best. But now we're yeah. going to get into Badlands. I know people want to hear about that. But before we do that, the Ozzy story is not completely over. <laughs> it, there is a phone call uh, again. Ozzy's looking for a bass player. Tell me what happens. Well, what, what they had announced on MTV that they wanted to uh, – everyone to uh, send in their packages and their photos and their uh, demo of them playing. Cause Ozzy was going to do it through MTV. And so they did this huge cattle call and I wasn't even going to send it in. And Bobby Blotzer from rat was one of my best friends at the time. And my other really good friend was photographer, Ross Halfin. Mm -hmm. And when Ross would come to town, I would hang out with them. And so they both kind of convinced me to send this tape to Ozzy. So I sent him, a photo of me in a bio and the only tape I sent him was me playing my bass into a ghetto blaster just re on the tape. It wasn't, there was no music. It was just me playing. And I, and, uh, and then I re played a song on the radio and I played to it and I sent it in. It was real cheesy considering some guys were spending three or $4,000 getting photo shoots and going in real studios. I didn't do any of that because I didn't think it was even possible that I was going to get the gig. And uh, out of the blue, I get a phone call. I'm going to do my best Sharon Osbourne here. And I get a phone call and I, I pick up the phone and she goes, uh, can I speak to Greg? And I said, yes, Greg. Hi, Greg, this is Sharon Osbourne. And uh, we, we got your package and we really like it. And we'd like you to come and audition for Ozzy. And I said, Blotzer, you prick, this isn't funny. I thought it was Bobby pulling a prank on me. And I hang up on her. And she said, so she calls back and she says, no, Greg, it really is Sharon Osborne, And we really like what you do. And we like your picture and we'd like you to, you know, come and audition for Ozzy. So I'm like, F you, Blotzer. And I hang up again. Mm -hmm. So she calls back a third time. She goes, Greg, this really is Sharon Osborne, And if you hang up on me again, I'm not calling you back. And I said, okay. And she, we'd really like you to come and audition. I thought the auditions were in L.A. So I said, well, okay, where do you, where and when? She said, well, we want to fly you to England for the audition is in, in, the, in the UK. And I went, oh, flying. I don't like flying. And uh, the other thing was uh, the rumor was that Jake wasn't in the band, uh, that he had been let go after the Bark at the Moon. Now, I had seen Jake play in L.A. a couple times before he was an Aussie, and I thought he was the best guitar player I'd ever seen. So part of my motivation for going on and auditioning for Ozzy would have been for the opportunity to play with Jake, because it's like, you know, how many times do you get to play with Jimi Hendrix or Jimmy Page or Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, someone that's your, your favorite guitar player. And I thought, well, even if I don't get the gig, I'll go audition. And anyway, and I'll get to play, you know, at least audition with Jake and maybe who knows, maybe we'll become friends. And so, uh, she said, she said, well, it's, it's in, uh, we're going to fly you to England. And I said, meh. I said, well, I don't know. Um, I don't really like flying. And I heard Jake's not in the band anymore. And I really was kind of looking forward to playing with Jake. And she said, no, he's still in the band. I said, oh, he is? And she said, yeah. 
I said, okay, um, well, I don't really like London. I'd never been to London. Mm -hmm. I just was making it up as I was going along. And she said, well, you're only going to be in London for like long enough to change planes. And then you're, we're going to fly you up to Inverness, Scotland. And I said, Inverness, isn't that by Loch Ness? And she said, yeah, it's right by there. I said, all right. And keep in mind, I have no credibility what's, whatsoever. I'm known in LA and I'm known in Phoenix. That's it. And so I said, here's, here's the deal, Sharon. I'll fly to Scotland and audition for Ozzy Osbourne if you'll take me to see Loch Ness. <laughs> and she, I'm like bargaining with one of the most powerful women in rock and probably the most powerful women eventually. And she said, okay, if you come out, we'll make sure someone takes you to Loch Ness. So I flew out there and I don't like flying. And that was, it was a really harrowing experience. Uh, there was a, almost a collision for our plane getting ready to land at Heathrow airport. Another plane came within 200 yards of us, which is like considered like 200 feet when you're in an airplane flying that high. So the plane actually tilted sideways, scared the crap out of me. And, uh, the woman next to me, she was an old woman, her wig flew off. That's how sideways it went. And all the baggage overhead baggage opened and everything fell out. I thought, great, I'm going to die before I even get to audition for Ozzy. I'm going to die in a plane crash. Of and all then, things, to, uh, as if Ozzy Osbourne hasn't been plagued by plane crashes. Yeah, I know. And then I got to get off the plane in London and then get right on another plane and fly to Scotland. So by the time I got to Scotland, I was like, I was like a basket case. But um, they, you know, I had a good time while I was there. Um, Randy Castillo is a great drummer. Uh, Jake and I kind of met. We had a lot of things in common. He has a martial arts background. So do I. Um, he likes the same kind of music I do. Uh, he was he was kind of a fitness junkie. So was I. So we had a lot of things in common right out of the, out of the box. And uh, we ended up becoming good friends. Like I said, it was a real trip to play with Ozzy. Um, I got to 101 things you didn't that you never wanted to know about Ozzy Osbourne. I got to know them. So yeah. he's, a, he's a character. I'll give him this. I never did meet Sharon. I can tell you a, a, a quick, quick sidebar here. When I first moved back to Arizona, Ozzy uh, had Joe Holmes in the band, was his guitar player at that point. So after Zach, he had Joe Holmes. Joe Holmes is an old friend of mine. I played in a couple bands with him in L.A. before I got in Badlands. Matter of fact, I, had I not got in Badlands, I probably would have – played in another band with Joe Holmes. We were really good friends and uh, liked the way each other played. So I get a phone call. Uh, Ozzy had fired, was looking for a bass player. And I got a phone call at my house in Phoenix and it's Sharon Osborne. And she's like, uh, hey, Greg, um, what, uh, Joe Holmes says that we should really talk to you and, and uh, we'd be interested in you coming and auditioning for the band. And I thought, uh, you know, Sharon, we've actually done this before. We've actually talked and I actually auditioned for Ozzy. She goes, you did? And she said, when was that? I said, for the Ultimate Sin record. And I said, I uh, didn't get the gig. Um, Ozzy didn't think I had the right look for uh, MTV, which is probably actually Sharon. And uh, I ended up being in Badlands with Jakey e. Lee. And she went, oh, you know what? Let me get back to you. And I never heard from her again. Yeah, that's uh, a, <laughs> yeah, that's a, sounds about right. It, sh it shows you their organization. They've been through so many people uh, uh, with those type of stories. So let's talk about Badlands 1989. This is a record that obviously guitar fans are crazy about, but also, as you were saying, even with your band, Atomic Kings, now that seventies vibe. And uh, this is a, you know, this is a great album that definitely stood the test of time. Jake's coming off Ozzy, so there's obviously a lot of interest in him doing this. And then you have Eric Singer playing drums on this album. You know, later Eric would play with everybody. Obviously, he's currently in Kiss. And then you have Ray Gillen, who is this incredible um, voice. You can't say enough. If people aren't that familiar with Badlands, go listen to Ray Gillen. Yeah, it's a great band. It's a great, you know. A great band to be part of. I mean, while Jake was in Aussie, like I said, we 
we were still friends and he would call me and he would talk about when I leave Ozzy, I'm going to start my own band. And, you know, I'd like you to, you know, check it out, maybe be part of it, which I took to saying, you know, I thought it meant, hey, when I leave Ozzy, I'm going to start my own band. You're going to be in it. And lo and behold, he leaves Ozzy and, and he and I, st I was going over to his house and he was playing me some of all these ideas and riffs that he had been saving up that didn't fit what Ozzy was doing that ended up being very Badlands-esque, you know, very 70s, very blues rock, very uh, different from what he was doing with Ozzy. It wasn't heavy metal. It was heavy, but it was hard rock. Ooh. And uh, he wanted to get a singer first. And uh, he ended up, uh, through Ray Gillen's mother, uh, getting a hold of Ray Gillen. And uh, Ray flew out on his own dime. And... Uh, came and auditioned and Ray knew Eric because Eric and Ray had been in Sabbath together. And so they went, I think it was just the three of them went and played just to see if any of that gelled. And uh, Jake and I were going out to BC Rich to about a week later. Um, they were courting him to be uh, in BC Rich in Dorsey and I already was one. And uh, they had kind of asked me, could you bring Jake down? And I said, yeah, maybe. So they sent a limo. And they picked up me and Jake and took us out to, to uh, lunch. And uh, BC Rich's factory was in El Monte, so it was quite a bit away. Riley! Hang on, there's a something on my screen here. So, and I can't see what it says. There's an offending thing on my screen here. I got you. All right, come here. All right. Oh, no. come, come here. This, is, this is my technical advisor. My lovely daughter, Riley, and everything I don't know, she knows. So, Thank God you rock stars have kids because otherwise you would never be connected. Well, the chances of me even being able to get my voicemails would be severely diminished if it wasn't for Riley. Well, thank you, Riley, for, for, for making dad accessible to us today. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, um, uh, where BC Rich was, it was about a, an hour drive. So while we were driving out there in this limo, Jake said, hey, you want to hear this tape I made of me rehearsing with Ray and this drummer? And I said, yeah, sure. And he put it in. And when I heard Ray's voice, I was like, whoa, man, this guy's got some serious pipes. And, and he said, what do you think of the singer? I said, yeah, he's great. I said, you know, one of the best I've ever heard. I said, but I'll tell you what. The drummer kicks ass too. Who's the drummer? And he goes, it's this guy, Eric Singer. I knew who Eric was. He'd played in Lita Ford. And uh, so I said, man, I said, does is, is he want to be in the band too? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, sounds like a really great drummer. He goes, yeah. He goes, I'm thinking of offering him the gig. And I said, I can't imagine it being any better. And then he said, well, <laughs> so then later on, he says, uh, well, we want you to come out and audition. And I went, uh, audition? And he said, yeah. I said, oh. He goes, why? Did you think I was just going to give you the gig? And I said, yeah, actually. <laughs> and and he said, no. I, he goes, I know a lot of other bass players that want to audition too. Just come out and audition. And I said, well, I had already told all my friends that, you know, when Jake left Badlands, him and I were, you know, I was going to, when Jake left Ozzy, him and I were going to be in a band together. So if I auditioned and didn't get the gig, I figured I would look like a complete idiot. So I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to audition right now. I said, audition a bunch of other guys. And if you can't find anyone you like, call me and I'll come and audition. So he said, okay. So he went and auditioned a bunch of guys and he would call me every week and say, haven't found anyone yet. Do you want to come and audition? And I said, eh, have you heard everyone yet? And he said, no. I said, well, when you've heard everyone, call me. So after they'd auditioned about 40 guys or so, he called me, said, are you going to come and audition or not? And I said, no, I'll come. So I went down there and auditioned. And I actually auditioned three times. And uh, he liked me right off the bat. But it took about two more times before Eric and Ray were convinced because they had a friend of theirs that they were interested in being in the band that was a great bass player as well. But um, he had a Black Sabbath connection, and Jake didn't want three guys from Sabbath and one guy from Ozzy. He wanted who was the who was the bass player? Um, 
Dave Spitz. That's what I was thinking, Dave Spitz, yeah. And he's a great bass player and, and would have been a great, you know, I can't say anything against Dave. He's a great bass player, nice guy. And uh, and uh, even Jake said he was a great bass player. But the, the thing about, um, I, I mean, I could have seen him being in there and I wouldn't have thought anything negative about it if I wasn't going to get the gig. But Jake really wanted me to be in the band and he just wanted the other guys to, you know, kind of go along with that. And so eventually they did. And I, I found out later that um, the reason that Jake had me audition is because a lot of people knew he and I were friends and he didn't want the perception that I got the gig just because we were friends. He wanted mm -hmm. people to think that I got the gig or know that I got the gig because I could handle the gig or I could play it. Or, you know, I know he, from auditioning in Aussie, he really liked the way I played because Jake's way of starting rehearsal every night is just a jam. So when I was in Aussie or with Aussie at, at the audition, me and him and Castillo would just get together and jam all the time. So Jake already knew kind of that I had that kind of improvisational gene. And that's a really important thing to Jake. Uh, Jake's idea of a good time is to just jam on 20 different riffs in the same time for 40 minutes. And that's also my idea of a good time. So mm -hmm. it was the perfect fit. Yeah, this record. Uh, so you guys record the album. Where was this record recorded? Half of it was recorded at One on One in L.A. And I think uh, their claim to fame, uh, great studio was I think Metallica had recorded a record there. And I believe the Bullet Boys recorded their first record there as well. I, I might be wrong. Excuse me. And then uh, Atlantic wasn't hearing the hit single. So they pulled us out of the studio and they brought Jake and Ray to New York to write songs till they got whatever they were looking for, which ended up being Dreams in the Dark. And then once they had all the songs, they wrote like maybe another half a dozen songs. They brought Eric and I out. Now, when they were in New York, they had a different drummer and a different bass player to just help them write the songs. And our manager at the time, Paul O'Neill, uh, rest in peace, but uh, not a very nice guy, at least in my eyes. Um, he wanted that other bass player and drummer, and I don't even know who they were to be. They wanted them to replace me and Eric. And Jake said, no, no, I, I already picked my two guys. These are my two guys. So they brought us out, and Paul O'Neill wanted us to listen to what these other guys had played and then play what they had already played. And Jake said, no, no, uh, Greg and Eric are going to write their own parts. Uh, that's the way this band's put together. I don't want, I've never heard the demos that they had with whoever the other bass player and drummer are. I've never heard them. And I don't even know if they exist anymore. Um, and Eric never heard them either. We just came out. They played us Dreams in the Dark and High Wire, you know, what they had. And then Eric and I wrote our own stuff to it. And did you uh, did you end up recording in New York? Was it Electric Ladyland? Uh, record plant. Record plant. Okay. The record plant, the same room and desk that Mountain recorded Nantucket Sleigh right on. Wow, that's not a bad room to to be yeah. in. No, I was I was when we went in there, and Jake and I are both Mountain fans, and he said he said you know who recorded in here, and I said no, and he goes Mountain Nantucket Sleigh right now. <laughs> Yeah. Now, I want to point out to the audience that um, you don't like to talk about the ne negativity and any controversy in, in certain events that happen with the band and especially Ray's untimely passing. That's not something that you're looking to do and, and that's understood. But as far as Paul O'Neill goes, uh, and for people who might not know, Paul O'Neill was involved with the band Sabotage and he created the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. And yes, he, ha he has passed away. But he is sort of uh, fingered as a problem with Badlands for a while, and uh, in between albums, especially, uh, you know, he, he's we fired. You, him. Yeah, he was almost kind of calling you guys, almost daring you guys to fire him. It, it sounds like he was almost, you know, trying to blackmail you guys in a sense. There were a number of improprieties that we found out that we weren't happy about. Um, we never wanted him to be our manager. We wanted a guy named Larry Mazur. We'd actually shaken hands with Larry Mazur at the time he was 
I think he was managing Cinderella, and I think he eventually went on to manage Kiss, I believe. Uh, really nice guy, and uh, we'd actually agreed to have him manage us. And Ray went back to New York, and uh, Ray at the time had been represented by Lieber and Krebs. Paul O'Neill was a gopher at Lieber and Krebs. Mm -hmm. And so Paul kind of convinced Ray to let him manage uh, Badlands, and he would in turn get us a record deal, and we would have our own label, and it would be we'd be the, able to do anything we wanted because it'd be our own custom label and blah, 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 uh, off of Atlantic's money and all this stuff. So when Ray came back, um, he said, Hey, look, I don't want to sign with Larry Mazur. I want to sign with this guy, Paul O'Neill. Well, at the time, Jake and I had no clue who he was. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Eric did either. Eric may have, because he'd kind of been, um, you know, a side man in a lot of other bands. Yeah. So he may have known him. But I was like, I don't even know who he is. So he came and met us. And uh, Jake and I didn't like him at all. Neither did Eric. And and I don't even think Ray really liked him that much. It's just that Paul said he would definitely take care of Ray. And Ray would be his main focus. And uh, Jake and I just thought he was pretty greasy. And we didn't trust him. And uh, um, it just turned out to be kind of a mess. He He didn't. There was a time when we were in the studio recording the record and Paul wouldn't do or Jake wouldn't do anything Paul said. So they actually came to me and said, hey, we're thinking of kicking Jake out of the band and we're going to get another guitar player. Are you are you down with this? And I said, are you guys out of your mind? You're going to kick out Jakey e. Lee. The reason that we're even here because of Jakey e. Lee mm -hmm. and you're going to get another guitar player. Instead of Jakey e. Lee, and that's a good thing, you think? And they said, well, yeah, because, you know, he's not doing what we want in the studio. And I said, I'll tell you what, you guys do what you want. I'll stay with Jake. Um, we'll figure out something else to do. Again, Jake's my favorite guitar player. So there's, you know, hey, we're thinking of uh, kicking Jimi Hendrix out of the Jimi Hendrix experience. Right. Wait, wait, what do you think? What? Are you guys insane? So I, I never mentioned it to Jake because I didn't want to rock the boat. And after a while, they came to their senses and we made the record. But the whole time while we were on tour, there was just a number of things that we didn't like with Paul O'Neill. It just didn't, he didn't seem to, first of all, he ended up getting songwriting credits on the record. We didn't know anything about that. We didn't know that he was going to be getting any songwriting credits mm -hmm. because uh, the whole idea was it was just going to be written by Jake and Ray. And so this all happened when the album came out. We're like, how come Paul has songwriting credits on here? And maybe he did write a, a lyric here or there. I don't know. It's possible he did. But um, there were just a lot of things that were kind of happening that weren't supposed to be happening. So after the first tour, we just said, by the time the first tour was over, we were like, we hated him. And yeah. even Ray didn't like him anymore. And so we decided to uh, fire him. Yeah. Which we did, and I got to do it. I said, they said, we're going to fire him. I said, I'll do it. Because they were like, how are we going to fire him? I'll do it. I'll definitely do it. Let me do it, please, please. So I did it. Oh, wow. He goes, well, you got to pay my bills from my credit card <clears throat> for the two credit cards I've been using to, uh, you know, take care of the band. I said, fine. Send me an itemized account of every bill on these two credit cards, and we'll – well, I've never had to send an itemized account before. Well, you do now. And uh, here's a word of advice, kiddies. Never have your manager be part of your record company. That's a bad move. That would be uh, what we like to call a conflict of interest. Conflict of interest for sure. Because all of a sudden, the guy that's supposed to go to the record company and fight for you, he's part of the record company. He's getting He's double dipping. He's getting paid by us and the record company. And the booking agent was a complete foobar. So at the time, I, I just fired him. I don't know if we ever paid his bills because I don't think he ever sent an itemized account in because there was just a lot of things that didn't make sense to us. And getting rid of Paul O'Neill was, without a doubt, the best thing that ever happened to us. I know that he did Trans-Siberian Orchestra and Sabotage. I'm not talking about any of that. Yeah. I'm just talking about my personal experience 
Badlands personal experience. Jake would tell you, I, Jake might tell you in no uncertain terms more than I would tell you. I, I think he, I think Jake has. And, you know, I know you don't want to talk about it, but there is this issue of Paul threatening to blackmail the band with he the did, label. He, he, what he did is he said, if you fire me, I'm going to tell everyone that Ray has AIDS. Right. Well, at the time, we didn't know anything about that. We didn't know, we didn't know Ray had AIDS. Yeah. And so when we fired him, what he did is he, he let it out. He, he went and told everyone in the press that, by the way, Ray Gillen has AIDS. And at the time, we, like I said, we didn't know anything about it. We were like, huh? We had no clue. So, I mean, think what you want. I don't normally speak ill of the dead. And, and I, like I said, God rest his soul. But that kind of stuff is just not, it's just not how you do business. And yeah. he, 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 it was kind of like, if I can't have Badlands, no one can have Badlands. It sure sounds that way. And this is a different time. It, you know, uh, AIDS, it, it, you know, a record label hears that and they think, well, I'm not going to put any money into this. The, the, you know, this is not going to last. You know, very different mindset than it would have been today. And yeah, it sounds like Paul says, well, I'm going to, no pun intended, sabotage <laughs> or sabotage the band. Well, I'm, Paul was going to take his basketball and go home. And, and if he couldn't have it, so we ended up finding two we, we found two other managers, Eddie, uh, Tom Hulick and Eddie Wenrick, who were at the time were managing Warrant, mm -hmm. uh, amongst other bands. They also managed the Beach Boys and the Moody Blues and a bunch of other bands. I think, uh, what was the name of that band? Um, Pretty Boy Floyd, I think. Yeah. And they were, they were great. They were, but at the top, but we, problem is we were on Atlantic. And because Paul O'Neill was still involved in the record company part of it, we were at kind of an impasse. They weren't giving us any tour support. They weren't going to do anything. They weren't going to re-sign us. They, uh, we had a two record deal. We, we didn't want to be re-signed by them anyway. We didn't, along with Paul, we, who we didn't like, we also didn't like Jason Flom, uh, who was, who's now the head of that, but we didn't like him at all. He didn't like us at all. We wouldn't do anything he said. And he would say, I want you to write with outside songwriters. And we'd say, you write with an outside songwriter. We're going to write our own songs. We like our songs. We don't need an outside songwriter. Well, we want you to write with Desmond Child. We don't want to write with Desmond Child. We want to do, you know, well, I want you to do a copy of Vandenberg's Burning Heart. Well, how are you going to do a better version of Vandenberg's Burning Heart than Vandenberg already does? It's a brilliant version. Why would we even do that? Which is how we ended up doing Fire and Rain. That was our, they wanted some kind of power ballad. That was our power ballad. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So uh, we're looking at Voodoo Highway here. And so interesting thing is that you guys do go out and tour on this record, right? Yes, we did. And... Uh, I believe I saw you guys in New York City at the Ritz, which we used to be Studio Fifty Four, and uh, that was a banging show, dude. Yeah, it was a it was a great night for sure. And so, this uh, at, at some point in this record, Ray uh, Ray's going to leave the band. Uh, no, um, Ray was. We were all still, you know, everything was still working. Pretty much. I mean, we had our differences of opinion by then. And the problem was that, you know, everyone had a point of view and all of us were probably right. But we all didn't see exactly the same way. I saw things pretty much. Jake and I were always in lockstep. Ray was kind of looking at it a different way. Jeff was kind of just going along, you know, for the party, he was just happy to be in the band. But at, after that tour ended and we were writing for, uh, demos for a potential third record for whoever was going to sign us because we had a lot of label interest. We'd left Atlantic. Um, things had kind of come to a head with Ray. Um, he wanted, we wanted some input on what he was doing. He wasn't interested in giving us any of that input. And so it just came to the point where it didn't seem like we were all going in the same direction. So we made the misguided mistake of letting Ray go. And I mean, in hindsight, that was a huge mistake. We should have just worked it out. And, but at the time there'd been enough 
in our, in our four years together and two records had been en enough bad water under the bridge that we were kind of just looking around to see if there was a better opportunity of, of something that would make the band work better. And uh, we ended up having other singers come and audition for us. And we even had a guy for a while, but it ended up not working out. A guy John, named John West was the name of the guy who you yeah. had, right? Yeah, but John came in at the wrong time. We didn't have any money. John thought he was joining like a big rock band that had like all kinds of money and he wanted a salary. And hell, we weren't even on salary at that point. And so um, I had a job. So it's like everything was kind of falling apart at that point. Well, then we got offered this tour to go to England and Scotland for like six weeks. And we ended up asking Ray to come back. We were going to use a different singer, but the, the promoters there said, if you're not going to use Ray, we're just going to cancel this whole thing. So we ended up asking Ray to come back and do this tour with us, which he did. I got to say this, no matter what kind of crap was going on off stage, in the dressing room, at rehearsal, whatever, man, we always delivered. We never let that affect us on stage. We always came out and did it. Ray sang his ass off every single night. And I got to say this about Ray. Um, if Ray was alive today, I can guarantee you that he and Jake and I would have done something, a number of somethings at this point. Maybe we wouldn't have stayed together, but we would be, we would get together from time to time and had done stuff. That's just the musical camaraderie was there. I don't know who the drummer would have been. Um, I, I have no idea. But well, we should mention that Eric Singer left in between records. Uh, what was the reason for that? Same thing. Same thing that with Ray. Eric was just kind of going in a different direction from us. It seemed like he wanted to go in a more commercial direction, and he also was the li li liaison between us and the record company and the booking agent and Paul O'Neill and our accountant. And he was the one that was saying, Hey, stuff isn't being handled right here. And so, um, when we eventually let Eric go, um, which probably was a mistake and I, don't get me wrong. I love Jeff. We've known each other since high school, but it's always, it would have been better if we could have all stayed together in my opinion, but yeah. it just wasn't going to work. So we let Eric go within a, an hour. He was probably in Alice Cooper. And then yes, he, was, he, he continued to work. Yeah, Eric is, Eric's worth, I think I looked it up the other day. I think Eric's worth like $20 million and I'm worth a buck and a half. So he made, we did Eric a huge favor. Yeah, uh, you're right. You should got a percent. Uh, so, but, uh, and then Jeff Martin comes in, who is your old friend, the singer for Surgical Steel. What's funny is he's the singer for Racer X but he is, becomes the drummer for Badlands. Very few people to do that cross. Well, Jeff was a, I've known Jeff since uh, the end of high school and he was always an amazing drummer. <clears throat> and we played in bands together. And then when Priest came out, Jeff all of a sudden had this uncanny ability to kind of mimic Rob. Mm -hmm. So he eventually became a singer. And it's funny cause I went to, uh, we were auditioning drummers in LA and uh, we had probably auditioned 25 guys. And I kept saying, uh, Jeff said, Hey, let's get me an audition. And I said uh, to Jake and Ray, let my buddy Jeff come down. And they said, it need a singer from racer X. <laughs> I said, yeah. And they said, why waste anyone's time with that? I said, I'm telling you, have him come down. He's, doesn't play like anyone else. He's a friggin' incredible drummer. I mean, he's like Ian Pace and Mitch Mitchell. I mean, he's got that kind of vibe and those kind of chops. And so that he came down and uh, I had told him, I said, when you get there, don't play the drums in the studio, bring your own drums and set up your own drums. And then once you set them up, don't say anything, just play a solo for about, oh, three or four minutes. Just sit there and just rail on them. And that's what he did. He brought his own set of Ludwig drums and he set them up and he got them and we're all kind of looking at them. And I know what's going to happen, but they're going to go kind of going, I don't know. And then he starts playing. And they're like, uh, what? And uh, he played some songs and he got the gig. 
and he was the right guy because he's just a complete whack. He's a wackadoodle anyway, really off the wall sense of humor. And me, we actually needed somebody like that in the band at the time. Things were already bad enough. We had fired Paul O'Neill. We were going through some financial difficulties. It was a good move. Yeah. And so, okay, so we, we doubled back a little bit. But so moving forward in 1993, Ray Gillen, uh, you know, loses his life, uh, loses his battle um, to, uh, with AIDS uh, disease. And so uh, at that point... Is bad? Are you just done with Badlands? Grunge music's coming in. Things are changing. Was there ever any talk? It's still trying to keep going. Uh, Jake and I talked about it. Um, once we did the uh, the tour of uh, England and and um, Scotland, Ray wasn't going to be involved anymore. There was just too much bad blood in a way, and uh, too much, too much, uh, too many arguments. Too many. No people not seeing things the same way. And so at that point, Jake said, let's just start another band. You mm -hmm. and I will start another band. We'll get another singer and a drummer and we'll do something. And I said, yeah, that's cool. I'm, I'm into it. Um, but I'm going to move to Phoenix. Uh, uh, my son was born then and I wanted to uh, buy a house, which I couldn't afford to do in LA, but I could afford to do it here. And uh, I wanted my son to be brought up around uh, my in-laws and also my parents who were alive at the time. They're not anymore. And uh, I said, but we could still do something. He goes, well, if you're living in L.A., I mean, in Phoenix, how are we going to do this? I said, I'll fly out. <coughs> I'll come out. We'll make it work. But it just kind of fizzled away. I mean, unfortunately, I, I, I mean, had I stayed in L.A., we, I'm sure we would have done something and I would have in hindsight, wished that we had have kind of stayed in contact. We kind of lost track of each other for about, I don't know, till dusk came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah, Jake kind of falls off the earth for a while. Uh, there was a time when he, and it feel, I feel like the music industry sort of beat him up, as it probably beat up a lot of people, yourself included. But I think at that point, Jake really wanted um, – a break and yes jake sort of has made the comeback with red dragon cartel but at, i was i see jake around vegas all the time he's one of the people that they everyone asks to have on the show they tell me they want warren Martini, they want vito brada and they want jake ely and i said as great as jake is and he, he tell you the best stories i don't see him sitting in his living room on a phone i certainly don't see him knowing how to 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 set this up i could be wrong but he'll he, he will tell you about uh, where to get the best Japanese hot dog in Las Vegas. I think it's called Bocce Burger. He'll tell you about Love It Custard, which is his favorite spot. Yeah, and when I was in Red Dragon Cartel, he said, I know where I'm taking you. And we went there. He he told me once he took Warren Martini. they were going to see Aerosmith, and they went early in the day to Love It Custard, and Warren liked it so much that he wanted to go back again before he, he left. <laughs> These two uh, reclusive characters, the guitar legends, are hanging out downtown Las Vegas at Love It Custard. Um, but uh, yeah, and so it, it was a number of years. You made a solo record though, or I think around 94, you stayed busy. Um, I did a solo record and I was doing a, a friend, one of my original roommates uh, was in a Christian band called Die Happy. And they had asked me if I wanted to play on their record and they would pay me. And at the time I was kind of looking for, you know, where I could make some money at it. Uh, come to find out they hadn't written any songs for their records. So I ended up co-writing uh, the whole record with them and even kind of producing it. And I did two records with them. And through that, I ended up getting a solo deal on my own. I started doing a bunch of records for Mike Barney for uh, his Blues Bureau label. I did uh, a couple other records for other people, uh, a, uh, a Daryl Mansfield record. Um, there's a, I did a bunch of Japanese singer slash guitar player records where I'd play three or four songs on them. So I, I stayed busy, um, moved back here to Phoenix, would fly to LA or fly up to San Francisco to do all these different recording things I was doing. I did a Pat Travers record for Mike Marnie and, and, a, and a bunch of stuff like that. But in the end, I, the money wasn't good enough for me to keep doing that. And I had had a regular job here, so it was kind of 
affecting my ability to have my regular job. So I decided to just kind of let everything, I kind of got off the grid. I got way off the radar and I got way off of it where people didn't even know if I was around. Kind of like Jake. Where, yeah. I mean, people didn't have the same interest in me as they had in Jake, but <clears throat> I just got completely off the grid. And like I said, I didn't even talk to Jake for, I don't know, six years till, till we, uh, till we mixed the uh, that record there, the, the Dusk record. Yeah, this um, is 1998 that this comes out. And so explain a little bit about how this comes about. Um, we were getting ready to go on tour uh, on for part of Voodoo Highway, and uh, our manager said, you got to go at, into Goodnight LA studio, Keith Olsen's studio, and record these demos <clears throat> for all these labels that are interested in you guys. Well, at the time... The way Badlands works or worked is if we were writing, we didn't do shows. And if we were doing, doing shows, we didn't write. We weren't the kind of band that wrote on the road. We didn't write in our hotel room or on the bus or any of that kind of crap. We just kind of did what we were doing at the time. So we were getting ready to go on the road in like two or three days for like about, I don't know, three, three and a half month tour. And uh, they said, you got to go in the studio. And we didn't want to go. And they said, you got to go. We already paid for it. So Jake and I begrudgingly showed up to Goodnight LA with bad attitudes, carrying handguns that we were showing each other that we were bringing on the road with us because we were both gun nuts. So we would both bring guns and on our days off, we'd go shoot at the shooting range. So we show up at the studio. The engineer sees us with all these handguns. So he's like, these guys are insane. I don't want to even be around these guys. So we recorded, uh, Jake said, we'll record each song one time, no overdubs, if we screw it up, we screw it up. Let's just blow through these songs. I want to get the hell out of here. And I actually did too. Mm -hmm. So I said, fine. So we played each song one time. There's no overdubs. Ray sang them live as Ray did in the studio. Ray sang every take, every rehearsal, every time in the studio, every everything, every sound check, Ray sang. He never just sat out and said, uh, I mean, my voice is sore today. I'm not going to sing. Ray always sang. And that's what Dusk is. There's only one overdub on the record. Jake and I decided when we mixed it to uh, add a vocal harmony to Sun Red Sun just to see what it would sound like because he had always wanted to do that when we were going to make a record out of it. Other than that, it's completely live. The solos are live. Well, we ended up not getting a record deal. The band broke up, blah, blah, blah. So there was all this talk about the lost badlands third album demos mm -hmm. and jake and i had copies of them but we didn't have the masters of them well out of the blue a bunch of labels wanted to buy them and so uh i had to find out who had the masters and i found the engineer who by the way still remembered me and hated me still yeah. because we, he didn't like our attitude in the studio and he didn't like the fact that we didn't want to be there and that we had guns and all this crap. So he was like, uh, I'll sell you the masters for $15,000. So I borrowed $15,000 and bought the masters. And then, uh, we sold them to Pony Canyon in Japan for whatever the amount of money was. I don't remember. And I got paid back my money and <clears throat> we, remixed it. So um, I hadn't seen Jake in a number of years and we re remixed it at Matt Thor who played uh, bass in Rough Cut. Yeah, Rough Cut. We mixed it at his studio. I would go in in the day and mix. It took like about a week and I would mix during the day with Matt and then Jake would come in in the afternoon and then he would mix all night and he'd fix whatever he didn't like that I did or change around whatever. And uh, then then I would come in the next day and I wouldn't do anything to what he did. And then I would kind of get just a basic mix down for Jake. And then he would come in and finalize it is kind of how it worked. But through the interim, we would go to dinner every night and we kind of rekindled our friendship again through that. And then when dust came out, you know, people were really into it. And then he and I kind of lost touch again for hmm, hmm, 10 years. Yeah, he, he, he disappear he disappears. And apparently so do you. We should mention one other funny connection though. Uh 
Matt Thorne being in Rough Cut, that's where Jake Lee started. He comes from San Diego, and yeah. he was in the original Rough Cut, too, before he – I don't think Matt was the bass player at that time. I think the bass player in the band when Jake was in it was Joey Chris. Yeah, I think Matt came as Jake was was going out. Yeah, I think it's a deal. You know, with uh, with uh, um, Chris Hagar, I think. Chris Hagar, yeah. And uh, because th at that point, then Jake would go to Dio, at, which didn't work out, but then would end up with Ozzy. So it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, when I first moved to L.A., I was at a party uh, and I was there with my two roommates and they were pointing out who everyone was. And I didn't really know anybody at, at the time. And he was saying, they were saying, oh, that's this bass player. That's, that's Rick Fox. He's the bass player in Steeler. That's Nikki Six. That's Blackie Lawless. That's, you know, Paul Shortino. And I'm like going, oh. And, they, and then Jake showed up and they said, oh, man, that's Jake Williams. And that's the best guitar player in L.A. Jake, that's, that's, he plays in Rough Cut. He's the best guy. And at the time, I think he had just... I think he had been in Dio and then got in Rough Cut again. I, there was some kind of weird thing that happened. And I was like, oh, okay. So I kind of made a mental note. And when I got an opportunity to go see Rough Cut play, we played in a place called Madame Wong's West. Mm -hmm. uh, I went because Jake was there. Because you're saying this is the best guitar player in L.A. I want to see what the deal is. And he sure enough was the best guitar player in L.A. And actually he was the best guitar player I'd ever seen. Yeah, pretty. Oh, the, beauty, the beauty of Badlands. I mean, I, I'm in Badlands, and I'm with the best guitar player I've ever seen. I'm with the arguably the best singer of his generation, and one of the best singers of any generation. And Eric Singer and Jeff Martin are two killer drummers, and we're playing this great material that I love. And you're sitting there playing, going, "I don't give a shit how bad things are off stage. I'm in the best band in the world. This is." What could be worse? I mean, what could be bad about this? What, What's not to like? Yeah, so, absolutely. And I've got to tell you this because I don't think many people have ever spoke about it, but I went to a memorial service for Ray Gillen uh, that his mother was uh, sort of put together. And it was at Irving Plaza, which is a club in New York City. Ray lived in New York and that's where he passed. And uh, what an, an interesting lineup of people who were performing that night. Janie Lane from Warrant, the band Trapeze, uh, so you had Glenn Hughes up there singing those songs, and you had uh, Mel Galley from White Snake, Noel Redding uh, from Jimi Hendrix's band was there. It was really a, a, an amazing night, uh, and Glenn Hughes, what a great voice to pay respect um, to Ray Gillen. And uh, it was a really an incredible night, but an odd thing, and I think maybe you guys weren't really ready to be part of those kind of things. Uh, you know, um First of all, Glenn is the one that called me and told me that Ray had passed away. So uh, Glenn and I were friends, and uh, that was a pretty weird day. Um, there was some acrimony. I, I, I'm Jake and I would like to have showed up, but um, A, we didn't have enough money to make the plane, the plane flight at the time. We were broke. I mean, we were dead broke. And because we had fired Ray from the band and there had been all this – stuff going on i'm not sure whether it was the right time uh for us to show up there um you know just because of how things went down you know it all ended on a bad note in you know at our last shows in in england and when i heard ray was sick <clears throat> and he was in the hospital i called him and i left a message on his machine at his apartment saying, hey, I heard you're sick, and uh, hope you're feeling better soon. And I just want to say I regret all the crap that went down between us. And if I could do it over again, I would probably do some of it different. And uh, you're the best singer I ever, ever heard. And, you know, hope you're doing good and accept my apology. And I, he called me back and left a message on my machine because I was out. And he said, hey, it's really great to hear from you. And yeah, everything's cool. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be fine. As soon as I get out of the hospital, I'll call you and we'll talk. And and then obviously that never happened because he, he got out of the hospital, then went back in and then he passed. So it's a weird uh, dynamic. I mean, even though I think that Ray and I had kind of come to terms and I 
believe him and Jake had also come to terms. I, I don't know for a fact. Um, I think with him passing away, it wouldn't have been a good time for, um, while Jake and I would have liked to have been there, not sure how we would have been received and, and rightly so. Yeah, I understand. And, and def obviously a difficult time. And at that time also medical treatment wasn't, uh, you know, what it is today. So sadly his battle was uh, short. Uh, I want to make sure we point out before I let you go, I know you've got other things to do. I've kept you here for a long time. Uh, is uh, You did play with Jake and Red Dragon Cartel for a little while. They needed a bass player. You came in and you did it for a while. But you uh, you, you had a cancer diagnosis in this time. And so I want to know about that. I also want to know how you're doing now. Uh, I'm, I've am i been uh, on October 4th will be six years that I since my last cancer treatment. So I've been cancer free. Jake had called me um, in 2014 early on in the year and said, man, they, they, he wasn't digging the guy that was playing bass with them because he wasn't really a bass player. He was a guitar player playing bass. And there were some other issues there as well. And uh, he said, we, we're going to play at a show in Tempe at the Marquee, which is a big theater, 2,500 seater. Would you like to play that show with us? And I said, yeah, sure. And it was a combination of Red Dragon Cartel songs off the record, Aussie songs and some Badlands. I said, yeah, send me what you want me to play and I'll, I'll figure it out. So I did. He came to L.A. We rehearsed um, for three days uh, at a studio and we hadn't actually played together since the demise of Badlands. Mm -hmm. So we got together in the room with uh, the drummer Jonas and the singer uh, Dar uh, Darren and uh, we just jammed for like 45 minutes off just riffs that Jake had in his head. And at the end, he said, ah, that's what jamming is. Now, that's what I call jamming. And we played together. I did the show. It was a pretty good show. I, I had a great time. Um, and I thought I did a pretty good job. And, and they came to me after and said, we, they said, we want you to be in the band. Will you join the band with us? And I said, this is in March. I said, I can't join till August because I'd already committed to doing, I, I teach baseball. Mm -hmm. So I was working at a place in Tempe called Arizona World of Baseball. And uh, they uh, have a summer, they had a summer camp that ran for like nine or seven weeks, eight weeks. And I was the, the head instructor there. I was the guy that ran the whole thing for the camps. And so I had already committed to do it. I said, but if you don't find someone you still hate your bass player by August 4th, call me. And on August, and he would call me from time to time saying, oh, come on, you got to do it. And on August 4th, he called, he said, are you in or not? And I said, I'm in. So I went and rehearsed with them. And uh, we went and did, uh, I don't know, two or three weeks in Texas. And I was having a great time. I, I enjoyed playing in the band. I enjoyed playing the material. I enjoyed playing with Jake again, of course. Uh, Darren was a great singer. Jonas was a great drummer. Came home for Thanksgiving. Was in the Northwest, you know, uh, uh, I mean, Northeast, you know, New York and Toronto and Detroit and Boston and all that. But I was sick the whole time. And I don't get sick. I'm a health nut. And I don't smoke. I don't drink. I'm pretty boring. I don't do drugs. Never have. And uh, I had like, I was so sick with this ear infection and these doctors were just saying, Oh, it's just a sinus infection. Take this pill. Mm -hmm. Well, after the tour was over, I went and saw some more doctors and they couldn't find anything wrong with me. Well, come around April, I was diagnosed with uh, stage four tongue cancer. And at the time they gave me between eight and 11 months to live. So I called up Jake and I said, hey, man, I, I, I got to quit the band. He said, I got cancer. And he said, he, he goes, no way. And I said, yeah. And and he said, you, he was like freaked out by it. And we hung up and uh, he called me back a couple of days later. He goes, you really have cancer? I said, yeah. And he was, I said, and I can't do this tour because, and they had tour starting like in a month, three weeks, two weeks. I said, I can't do it because if I don't take this cancer treatment right now, because if I had done the tour, I would have waited all the way until the tour was over in October 
to, to, to get the final diagnosis, I'd have died in the spring. <clears throat> so I really had no choice and I hated to quit. Um, I mean, I enjoyed playing in the band. Uh, Jake's my best friend. Uh, it was really hard for me to quit, but I had no choice. I was going to die. And I wasn't even sure I was going to live through the treatment. So right away I had uh, surgery, had all my lymph nodes removed on this side, then had 44 doses of radiation, 15 doses of chemo, and managed to beat it. And, uh, I mean, Jake went on with the Red Dragon Cartel. Anthony did an excellent job, Anthony Esposito. Yeah. And I wish I had been part of it. And hopefully someday Jake and I will play together again. But uh, it's weird how shit just kind of happens. And that's just kind of, you know, if you would have told me in 2014, hey, you're going to have enough cancer in 2015, I'd have been like, yeah, right. Right. Not a chance. And, but there it is. So Well, and it's, it's a good thing that you got diagnosed. It, it seems like just in time, obviously, your health was more important. Um, and, you know, now the world is on hold anyway. And so who knows where, you know, things will happen. Uh, I've got to ask you before I let you go, the question that every uh, Badlands fan asks, is there any other unreleased music? Well, there's a whole bunch of demos and stuff that are out there that we did, I don't know, maybe recorded 30 songs for the first record in demo form. And uh, whether they ever see the light of day officially would be up to Jake. Um, he has control of that. Um, I, I co-wrote some of the material on some of that, but the, the lion's share of it, 90 plus percent of it is written by him. People always ask me why I never wrote much in Badlands, because I like the stuff Jake wrote. Mm -hmm. And um, I would throw in my two cents worth here and there, and, and we would use it, and sometimes we wouldn't. But I was really happy with what he wrote. So I didn't have, I'm not the kind of guy, even though in Atomic Kings, I do a lot of writing. It's not something i don't write like it's not like a cathartic thing like I, I need to do this for my soul i only write if i have to and so i didn't ever feel like i had to in atomic kings i'm one of the main writers and i enjoy it and uh it's a good time but uh i if jake ever released that other material i would be thrilled in well i'm going down i'm gonna go down to love it custard and find jake and tell them that we got to get those uh, recordings out because the fans want to. The fans want to hear them. I'll pay for his custard. Maybe it'll help. There you go. Make sure. Yeah, send me a custard too. I think. I think when I was there, we, we rehearsed for about a week. I think Jake and I went down there at least four times. And uh, he, Jake always said the only good thing about Badlands breaking up is um, him and I both have ridiculous sweet tooths. Mm -hmm. And he and I would show up at his house. My wife's a really good baker. So I would show up with all these desserts and he'd go, oh man. And once I was out of the band, he didn't have that anymore. And he goes, I finally lost weight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, leaving Red Dragon Cartel was hard, but that allowed me to do Atomic Kings. Absolutely. Um, I work, I, I manage a guitar store here in Phoenix, Bizarre Guitar and Drum. It's a great place to work. So it's kind of like one door closes, another one opens. Um, I always uh, hold out hope uh, and and uh, desire to play with Jake again. Uh, we still are really good friends, but my life's pretty good right now. Um, uh, I'm cancer free. I have my store that I run. If any of you are ever in Phoenix, come and see me at Bizarre Guitar and uh, Atomic Kings. Find us on Facebook and uh, like us. And uh, I know that we have a website being made at the moment, but. Uh, I've had a good career. I've got to play with great players. I've made some great friends. Uh, I got to be in LA when it was the most happening place on the planet. Mm -hmm. I got to play with my favorite guitar player of all time. I can't really, uh, I, I didn't miss anything. No, not at all. And there, there, there's still a future out there, as you said. So Greg, I really appreciate you spending some time. Everyone's gonna check out Atomic Kings. Go down to the description. We'll have all the links to what we can put up there and uh, start following that band. I really appreciate it, and uh, I hope that we'll see you again on the road before you know it. Well, you never know, and now it might be the the, uh, the, the, the super, super group of ex-Aussie uh, people that are affiliated with Aussie, with, with George and Carmine, and Jake would be in there, and, and Lynch, and 
Brad Gillis and Tommy Aldridge and uh, Don Costa, if you can find him somewhere. Uh, that should be a hell of a band. I agree. There could be a, we could fill a stadium. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we, Greg. Could, we could all tell our Aussie stories. Hey, yes. Survivors. All right, Greg. <laughs> thank you so much. Take care. Hey, thanks for having me. And thanks everyone.